Finance Committee report in their uh, authorization bill for 1994, they say that we should begin construction by 1999 or by the year 2000. The preliminary design would have to begin in 1994 or 1995. So that what, we, what we're doing in this bill, the $22 million in this bill, will give the Department of Energy the capability of doing enough R&D on this reactor to determine First, whether we ought to pursue the Russian connection, uh, where we would use their, uh, their ability on a 50-50 split with us. Frankly, most of their contribution would come in, in terms of expertise, buildings, uh, some supplies over there. Most of ours would, uh, I, I presume, come from money as well as expertise. In any event, an agreement has been signed with the Russians. The Russian energy minister has twice been in my office urging that I do everything that I can to promote this exchange. Uh, what's his name? The Russian energy minister. Uh, the Russian energy minister's name is Mikhailov, and he is very strong on this program. So what this does, it gives us a look-see at the, at the program. There, there's, there's still another aspect of, the, of this. The Russians have announced that they want to use their plutonium and their highly enriched uranium in a uh, reactor program. Uh, you know, you could say, well, why don't they just bury it out there in the desert somewhere? In the first place, a as we discussed in the last amendment, that's not proliferation proof. <clears throat> but more than that, it, it destroys the value of the plutonium and uh, this is a way to burn the plutonium because this can be a plutonium burner. Again, that produces half the amount of waste with a high degree of efficiency. Now, the projections, Mr. President, uh, by the designers of this reactor would show that it is more efficient and that it is uh, uh, than, a, than an ordinary light water reactor and more economically viable than a light water reactor. To be sure, those are the claims of the developers, but they are not claims for, with figures picked out of the air. They are rather engineering claims uh, made from the preliminary design which they have done. What we're asking, what the committee is asking, Mr. President, that is that we pursue uh, this technology through its early R&D stages to give us the answer to uh, two or three questions. First, uh, should we pursue it with the Russians who are very anxious to do it? Everybody's anxious to, to do uh, a cooperative R&D with, with the Russians, and this is, I mean, co a cooperative uh, commercial venture. This is such a venture. Second, is it, should it be pursued as a plutonium burner, and that's a, a very important nonproliferation issue. Uh, third, should it be pursued as an inherently safe uh, venture? And I believe that is the one characteristic that virtually everyone concedes, that it is inherently safe, can't melt down. And fourth, and perhaps uh, most important, are the claims for its uh, economic viability, do they stand up? Uh, and that is very important. And finally, uh, is it the right way to go as a tritium producer, at least in a standby capacity? It may be that we will not uh, want to have a reactor to make tritium. My guess is that we will, because you remember the K reactor down in South Carolina, we have closed. Uh, the senator from uh, Oregon and I both uh, agree that we should close that K reactor because it was, uh, uh, and I, I said, I mean, up in uh, Washington, because it was not a safe reactor. That doesn't mean we won't need technology for tritium in the future. This tells us this would give the option to have a look-see as to whether we can make tritium from a reactor. 
Is this the only possible technology for making tritium? <clears throat> well, we think that it might be able to be made in accelerators. Uh, I, I personally don't believe that technology is going to work out economically, but that is a possibility, and we need to look into that as well. But a prudent country doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, crack all its eggs uh, because uh, it doesn't need uh, a chicken right at the present time. It pursues its possibilities for its future needs. And that's what this relatively small amount of money does. It, it allows us to pursue what could be tremendous breakthroughs in safety, in economy, in nonproliferation, and in uh, tritium production that we don't now have. That's why the committee has put in the money. This technology is different from any studied by, uh, look at this was Fort St. Brain, which is the senator from New Jersey talked about. Absolutely we should not pursue Fort St. Brain. I do, Fort St. Brain couldn't be made to work. But that's like saying, well, you know, the Edsel didn't work, so don't build a, so abolish Detroit. Uh, this, is, this is new and different, and totally different. Uh, the reason we pursued technology at Fort St. Brain is because of that inherent, inherently safe characteristic. That's why the country spent money on Fort St. Brain. We think that this will help uh, uh, create not only the safe technology, but the uh, uh, proliferation uh, uh, ability, the uh, uh, ability to uh, produce the tritium, <coughs> and uh, all done at a very efficient and economically viable way. Well, so, Mr. President, I, I would hope that we would uh, continue with this. And well, the Senator, you for a question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to commend my colleague for uh, such a lucid description of a very highly technical issue. Methinks he speaks as a nuclear physicist. I should perhaps address him not as my colleague, Senator, but my colleague, Dr. Uh, Bennett Johnson. But I also have not only that feeling of awe and respect, but I also have a sense of fear. And that is that this ability that he has demonstrated to his colleagues here today might become a criteria for a future chairman of our subcommittee. <laughs> I thank the senator for his kind remarks. Uh, he is always uh, a wonderful uh, partner to work with. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I wonder if the uh, senator from New Jersey has disagreed with anything that I've said, and if so, uh, what it is, and should we engage in a, in a colloquy about it? Mr. President, if I could, I would like to um, uh, maybe comment on a few of the remarks that were made by the distinguished senator from Louisiana. Uh, well, while I, while I still have the floor, Mr. President, I, I really wanted to find out, does, does he agree, first of all, uh, with, the, uh, with my statement that this is an inherently safe technology? Um, I would say that every new generation of nuclear reactors is safer than the previous generation. That is inherent in a new generation of reactors. Um, I think it is too early to tell on this particular technology, however. And I think that is what one of the things is that's being tested. Um, well, I, I, I appreciate the, the Senator. Uh, and I, I think what I'm, what I'm hearing is that you don't disagree with the claims, but you have to do the research in order to find out whether, the, whether what everyone thinks is, is so really is so. Is that, is as that I, fair? As I heard the senator uh, speaking, and he can correct me if, if I was wrong, but that one of the key elements in safety uh, would be the uh, fact that the containment facility would not have to be as big or as strong as in other nuclear reactors. Is that true? Well, as a matter of fact, you would not need a containment building. But uh, I believe the NRC, nevertheless, would require a containment building, uh, a containment facility, so that it's uh, like belt and suspenders. You, you don't need it, but 
They say you, you got to wear a belt even though you have suspenders, and we built that into the economic projections here that their containment facility would be required. Well, you see, the, the, in, as I heard the senator making his comments, that was one of his points, that you would not need a containment facility. And now it has changed slightly to you maintaining the uh, assertion that you don't need a containment facility, but the NRC is going to force you to have a well, uh, containment it, facility, and well, I, we I have, find we, that to be a slight uh, contradiction. Well, no, I, I, I'm not saying that the NRC has said that they would require it. I would expect that they would because that seems to be their present policy. There's been no application to license this reactor uh, uh, sold it. We don't know what they would do. Uh, what I'm saying is that I believe the scientists would say that the claims for an inherently safe reactor, that at loss of coolant, the top temperature would be only 1,400 degrees, that this fuel has been tested at 1,800 degrees centigrade, and that they believe the melting point is well above 1,800 degrees centigrade. And, and that would dictate, since a meltdown is not possible, that a, uh, that a containment was not necessary. Now, whether they would require the belt and suspenders, nobody knows at, at this point. But, I mean, the, what we're after here is the safety. And I, uh, my first question was whether he agrees that that, 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 that safety uh, is there, and I, I assume that... The answer to that is, is yes. If I, if I could respond, it, it would be that it's uh, still you know, inconclusive. I would just point out that the NRC uh, has been reviewing the design as a part of an ongoing effort uh, of uh, licensing, questions about licensing, and they contracted for a review of the MHTGR technology, and it was a probability risk assessment. And this review concluded, and I'd like to just, if I could, uh, quote from the report, at this conceptual stage, it must be concluded that important elements of the design, such as the almost complete reliance on one passive, that's automatic, system for heat removal, the choice of non-safety related min minimal redundancy designs for other heat removal and support systems, and the current confinement 3 8 design, and the elimination of the operator from all but mundane tasks cannot be justified under the current PRA, which is probability risk assessment. It then goes on and says, it must be concluded that not only has the risk from the MHTGR not been completely assessed, but that the actual risk associated with the reactor here, this is the reactor, not the turbine, the reactor, may be substantially higher than, the est than estimated in the MHTGR uh, probability risk assessment. Well, but the senator, you see, keeps referring to the MHTGR, which is a different animal, a different generation from the GTMHR, which the, the fundamental difference here is that we have direct helium, uh, uh, the gas directly into the turbine. Whereas the previous generation uh, 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 had had the the uh, heat exchanger and relied upon water, and, and didn't have what we call the recuperator, which it w is able to uh, conserve the heat inside the reactor, and in turn is and in turn is uh, is able to give you that 50 percent less fuel, 50 percent less weight mm -hmm. waste, and 50 percent less uh, 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 waste heat. So the point I'm making to my uh, dear friend from New Jersey is that those were different animals. I mean, to say that Fort St. Brain or the HTGR or the MHTGR, this report or that report, it's not the same. This, mm -hmm. is, this is different, and the Russians like this one, and, uh, and, and this one is the one that we ought to have a look-see at from R&D. I guess uh, what I'm saying to the distinguished senator from Louisiana is that uh, I'm not uh, so comfortable with the significance of difference that he points to. 
Um, these are variations, but the real question is, are they that significantly different? And on that point, I would simply like to refer to the National Academy of Sciences study, which admittedly was uh, on the other technology, but I would like to read a footnote uh, that is in the study. The committee learned in mid-1991 that the MHTGR design had been changed. While the committee did not have an opportunity to review the new MHTGR study, the committee understands that the objective was to reduce costs while retaining a postulated safety advantage. Thus, some of the design details listed below may no longer be current. This is the operative sentence. However, the committee is not aware of any changes to the fundamental principles underlying the MHTGR concept discussed here. So the basic point is, yes, there can be some differences, but according to the National Academy of Sciences, they are not so significant as to alter the judgment of no funding for this project. That's how I read it, uh, and I would say to the distinguished senator, I, I uh, certainly stand in awe of his technical knowledge of the field, and as the chairman of the committee, he has long experience in, in the field. Um, but that's how I would, I would uh, read it. I would also make the point that uh, if uh, this was something that the industry wanted, that they would be uh, very pleased about this breakthrough in safety. And yet, uh, during the committee's hearings in 1991, uh, the head of the Southern Nuclear Company, who was a likely buyer, stated, I'm not sure we're far enough along with MHTGR technology to be fully certain as to the actual advantages on passive safety over the ALWR passive designs. Is the senator aware that um, even the anti-nuclear, traditionally anti-nuclear groups uh, I uh, have conceded, at least many of them, that this is uh, passively safe. A July 1990 study of advanced reactors prepared for the Union of Concerned Scientists, that was actually on the, on the previous generation, found that the MHR passive safety system, quote, requires no power to operate, relying on natural circulation of air. It requires no actuation signals to perform its safety function and it is not dependent on actuation of valves to perform its safety function. Uh, so I, I believe the passive safety element of this is, uh, is fairly well conceded. I, I, I think the big question is about the economics of it, and I, I concede that that is a big question, as it is on any new reactor. Well, I would say to the distinguished senator that I do think the economics is why this amendment is offered. Uh, the real question is, do we want to spend $22 million of taxpayer money? And on the point related to Russia, um, my basic attitude is let them put their 50 percent up first. Uh, I, I think if this was very important to our foreign policy with Russia, that this would have been in the uh, at least noted in the uh, foreign operations appropriation that we just passed two or three days ago. Um, I, I um, have some major uh, concerns about uh, the claim that the reason we should do this is to further our relations with Russia and that Russia will put up 50 percent. And my understanding is Russia's broke. Russia can't even take care of its nuclear reactors that are about to explode. To think they're now going to put uh, a lot of money into a technology that is uh, so distant, in my view, is uh, unmerited. Uh, well, Mr. President, the um, New York Times on April 6 had a story that goes on to say that an agreement between General Atomics and the Russian Ministry for Atomic Energy to form a reactor building venture was signed in Moscow Thursday and was made public by General Atomics yesterday. Top Russian officials are said to have pushed hard to have the issue discussed this past weekend at the Vancouver summit. 
It is not known whether the topic was aired, although President Clinton made clear he favors expanded technical cooperation. Uh, and it, uh, it, it goes on to uh, point out uh, that the, initial, uh, the initiative parallels joint plans already underway to burn Russia's vast supply of uranium and other fuel of nuclear warheads. Uh, last year, the Russian administration announced a deal with Russia to buy much of its highly enriched uranium from nuclear arms so it could be diluted into fuel for civilian power plants. Um, that agreement is snarled in bureaucratic red tape. Well, it goes on to, to talk about it, but I mean, it is, uh, it is a signed deal uh, with the Russians. It is, uh, it, it is brand new. I mean, it is just this year, and uh, we ought to have a look-see at it before we say, well, poo-poo on that. Uh, you know, no scientist has... No, no study report has been done on this. I'd like to see the National Academy of Sciences uh, take a look at the reactor. I'd like to uh, have a, uh, a, a judgment done at, at the uh, uh, on the on the deal with the Russians. Is it a, is a good one? They want to put up their expertise. Their, I mean, they've got all these unemployed scientists out there that that, that are a resource that the Russians could put up. I don't think we, before we look at it as a nation, we ought to say no that we shouldn't do it. Well, I'd say to the distinguished senator that uh, I think that he has just made the argument that I said, one of the arguments that is always made for these kinds of projects, and that is it's too soon to tell. And therefore, you know, we've got to put up some more money because we don't know whether this is going to work. And of course, uh, earlier today, uh, the, um, the argument was it's uh, too late to stop. And I, un I understand that when you're doing research, both of those are possible. And I certainly don't diminish the possibility of uh, those arguments being valid. But I've also uh, been in this chamber long enough to know that they are frequently made keep things moving ahead, too soon to tell, too soon to tell, a little bit more, a little bit more, then you cross the line, and then it's, it's done too much to stop. Well, Mr. President, and, uh, and I, and I think reasonable m men and women can disagree on where that point is. And I, I guess I, uh, what I'm saying is I see this as $700 million down the road in research and development. I see it a demonstration phase of a billion to $2 billion. Uh, I see this as a much bigger commitment than I think we can afford to make in our current budgetary circumstance. Uh -oh. I mean, I'm not over here because either I'm a physicist or because uh, I am against research. I'm certainly not a physicist, but I am for research. But you have to ask in the current environment, well, how much do you want to spend and what do you want to spend it for? And if we don't do this, is anybody going to do it? And I must say uh, that the fact that over 20 years we, we put up about $540 billion of public money and the industry has only put up $27 million lends me to conclude that, you know, as long as the taxpayer is prepared to do it for them, uh, they will very gladly go along with it. And well, I just well, want to say, President, let's stop. Uh, you know, the, the, the too soon to tell, too late to stop argument is you always have that. I mean, look, we've got nuclear fusion that the senator from New Jersey is very interested in, in which we have money for in here. We put up billions on nuclear fusion. The electric power industry not only is not putting up money on that, but they say don't put up money on it. They say it, it won't work, it'll never work. But we're proceeding with that because we believe it is a... We believe it is too soon to tell and that the payoff would be sufficient that we ought to pursue it. And I know that uh, I, don't, I don't say that to be rhetorically cute. I say it to illustrate a very important point, which is that we need to look at these technologies and, and not with any technology that comes along and say, well, they always say too soon to tell or they always say too late to stop and therefore we ought to stop before we can tell and we ought to stop 
you know, stop any technology. That should not be the attitude. The attitude should be to look at this with cold-eyed reality and try to fix a point at which you say go or no go. I'm not saying spend a billion dollars here and make that decision. Not saying that at all. I say we ought to do this this year and we ought to take a look at that Russian agreement and we ought to have a study on this uh, uh, being new technology and, uh, and find out uh, whether it does offer the kind of promises which on the face of it we, we think uh, obtain there. I, I wish the senator would, uh, would, would look at it in that light. I mean, this is not another boondoggle research project. This is one that has tremendous promise where we are close to the point at which uh, we, we should make a decision of go or no go. Um, I, I would thank the distinguished senator from Louisiana for his uh, comments. Uh, I'm prepared at, uh, in a very short time, if he'd like, to uh, move on uh, from this issue to another issue. I would just, uh, I, I can't let the, the uh, illusion, I know there was no intention to the fusion program in comparison to this uh, pass without at least a comment or two. One of the differences is that this president recommended $347 million for fusion, zero for this program. And uh, that is a very significant difference from my perspective. Um, the HTGR reactor was built in the 60s. We've never been able to really have a fusion reactor that worked. Uh, the HTR technology is based on uranium. The fusion is literally based on water. So, I mean, there are some real differences, and this is not, I know, the senator's intention. Uh, and uh, I would simply urge that we eliminate this uh, $22 million as just part of our efforts to reduce spending at a time where we have to begin to make some choices. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, uh, I believe the senator is saying that he's ready to move on to another amendment. As I understand it, we will not have any roll call votes before 6 o'clock. So uh, uh, I, I asked the parliamentarian if I should move to table now, would that vote occur at 6 o'clock? That will require unanimous consent to set the vote at 6 o'clock. And uh, do I understand uh, from floor staff that that is the wishes of the uh, majority leader, if I should make a motion to table now, that we have that vote at 6 o'clock? I believe we have. Well, Mr. President, uh, I ask unanimous consent that uh, that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm moved to table, ask for the yeas and nays, uh, uh, and ask unanimous consent that a vote on my motion occur at 6 p.m. Occur at, at 6 p.m. Is there objection? Um, is there any right to object? Do you okay. want a minute equally divided prior to the vote or two minutes? Uh, Mr. President, I think, uh, I think we ought to just go ahead and vote. I don't think a minute will do any good. Is there objection? Without objection. And, so and, and, uh, and I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is a sufficient second. Mr. President, I, I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
objections. So, without objection, oh, quorum call suspended. Quorum call rescinded. Without objection, the quorum call is suspended. I assume it's going to committee amendment be set aside. Without objection, committee amendment set aside. President, I send an amendment to the desk and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the amendment. The senator from New Jersey, Mr. Bradley, proposes an amendment number 990. On page 2, line 18, strike $208,544,000 and insert $157,600,000. On page Mr. President, seven. I ask unanimous consent that further reading of the amendment be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, um, I rise to offer uh, an amendment to this Energy and Water Appropriations Bill that would uh, reduce the Army Corps of Engineers and Bureau of Reclamation uh, figures and would lower the amount of money in this program to the President's request. I'd like to uh, make it clear to all members that the amendment would not cut into individual projects, but would only affect the overall spending level. Uh, it would leave the dis redistribution of the lower funding level up to the confrees uh, in the Appropriations Conference. In other words, uh, the conferees would have roughly um, $334 million less to allocate. But this amendment does not uh, reduce funding for any particular project. For years, Congress has routinely added funding and substantial growth in those, these projects, more or less ignoring the President's budget request. A president would request three, and the Congress would give him four. This year, if we follow the recommendations of the Energy and Water Subcommittee and the Appropriations Committee, the spending for the Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation will increase by 6.5 percent, well in excess of the inflation rate, well in excess of what uh, Social Security increase, for example, well in excess of what uh, programs to aid families to send their children to college increase, well above what uh, programs to help the poor increase. This would be a 6.5 percent increase. Simply put, um, it's business as usual. Uh, the amendment that uh, I offer leaves, as I said, the job of determining what to cut to the conferees. The amendment, I think, does trim down to the President's level. You can say it trims the fat if you want to. It would eliminate spending that the President didn't request, and it does so by reducing the amount of funds in the construction account, the operating budget, operating and maintenance account, and the investigations account of the Army Corps and the Bureau of Reclamation, and it reduces it by $334 million, which would still leave in this uh, account and in this appropriation $3.75 billion for water projects. That's roughly what the President asked for. This level equals uh, roughly the total appropriations that were given in fiscal year 1993. And I think that for many members who've been back in their districts talking about cutting the budget, one of the things that was said for a long time is, well, we ought to just freeze spending. This would be essentially a freeze on the spending for the Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of a reclamation. Mr. President, less than two months ago, we stood on the floor of this chamber and delivered lengthy speeches about uh, the need for deficit reduction, the need to cut government spending. We were going to have a special session of Congress. We were going to have special cut evenings. We were going to have this, that, and the other thing.
and everyone was around here wringing their hands because we couldn't really get at those discretionary programs uh, in the in the big budget bill all we could do was cut entitlements or raise taxes everybody said well when we get to those appropriations bills we're going to really cut spending then well we're going through these appropriations bills one by one and i don't see us cutting spending to the contrary uh, spending is going up and in this category spending is going up 6.5 percent everybody has water projects in their state. Everybody has Corps of Engineer projects, Bureau of Reclamation projects. They are important in a general sense to the health of a particular state. The President has requested roughly $3.75 billion, and I'm suggesting that we give him what he has requested, not increase it 6.5%. The President, in his budget request for the Bureau and the Army Corps, I think delivered on his part of the bargain to say that he was going to try to keep spending down, and I think it's up to us to follow through, or we're just going to pretend as if the deficit doesn't get bigger, that we can talk about uh, accounting gimmicks, or we can talk about increasing taxes, but when it comes to cutting spending, we're not willing to step up to the bar. I would like to place in the record uh, a letter, of, uh, statement of support from the administration for this amendment. Highest unanimous consent to be placed in the in the record at this time. Without objection, so ordered. I would also ask that uh, a letter endorsing the amendment from the National Taxpayers Union, the Friends of the Earth, the American Rivers, Council for Citizens Against Government Waste, National Wildlife Federation, the Sierra Club, and the League of Conservation Voters be placed in the record at this time. Without objection. Mr. President, this is another one of the attempts to try to say, are we going to have some discipline here? And now, it's quite conceivable that at the end of this whole appropriation process, we will not have any discipline, and we will have demonstrated it to the public. But on this amendment, what it says is $3.75 billion is enough. Spend $334 million less. Take it out of construction operations and maintenance and investigations. Don't take it out of, you know, there's no specific project here that's targeted. It would be up to the conference committee to decide. No single project loses because of this amendment. Ultimately, the decision rests with the conferees. And I would hope that uh, we'd be able to see our way through to vote for this. I'm under no illusion that it's unlikely. But I still think that the effort is worth making because if you believe that the deficit is eating away at our children's future, Maybe we can freeze some of these water projects for a year, one year, in order to reduce the deficit another $334 billion, million. That's really what this amendment does. I yield the floor. The chair recognizes the senator from Louisiana. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the committee's recommendation at $3.9 billion for the Corps and Bureau of Reclamation is less than the inflation increase from last year. So that this is not even keeping up with inflation. Uh, but a lot has happened since last year, Mr. President. We've had severe flooding on the Mississippi River, and we've had the passage of uh, Senator Bradley's bill, which I helped him a great deal. What was it called? The Reclamation Projects Authorization and Adjustment Acts, signed into law as Public Law 102-575, uh, which uh, uh, its estimated cost is $2.6 billion. Now, because we passed that bill, we put in this, in this bill, for example, the Los Angeles and San Gabriel Water Reclamation Projects, in California for $10,250,000. Central Utah Project, uh, $4 million. Uh, we have uh, 
flood control or uh, matters coming out of the Mississippi. Uh, Mr. President, a lot has changed since last year. Now, I'm for budget cutting, but in a year when uh, you've had all these tremendous floods and we're already less in real terms than we had last year, where are we going to take it from? I mean, some of these are, uh, are environmental projects. Uh, the the uh, uh, those that I just mentioned for uh, 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 our, our environmental projects, and I helped the senator from New Jersey get those passed. Sonoma Bay Wetlands, for example. I know the senator is interested in that. That's $4 million. We, I mean, the business of the world has got to go on, Mr. President. Uh, I mean, we've already cut below last year in real terms. Uh, to be sure, we are less than the president uh, requested. I mean, we are more than the president requested, but we're la less than last year in real terms. I mean, just how much are we supposed to cut? Now, Mr. President, uh, there are $215 million, some of those I just mentioned, that were not requested by the president. Some of them uh, involve uh, flood control studies that the president didn't know about on the Mississippi. Projects like uh, West Columbus Flood Control Project in Ohio, Molly's Brook in New Jersey, Leviza and Tug Fork in West Virginia, O'Hare Reservoir in uh, Illinois. Ask the Illinois senators whether O'Hare Reservoir is important. I can tell you, I mean, that's not fluff. That's not, that's not the cream on top of the pie, Mr. President. That is the meat and bones and sinew of, uh, of this bill, those kind of projects. And I don't know why it wasn't requested. Barberville and Harlan, Kentucky projects, Passaic River flood control project in New Jersey. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the senator can tell me the importance of that. Uh, Mr. President, here are a few more examples. Bethel, Alaska, we have a $2 million project. Uh, 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 Onondaga stormwater discharge in New York, 11 million. Uh, Mr. Pr Mr. President, that Onondaga is one of the most polluted lakes in the entire nation. And Senator Moynihan's initiative gets us started on Onondaga. Uh, uh, O'Hare Reservoir, McCook and Thornton Reservoirs in Illinois, 18 million. West Columbus flood control, I just mentioned that, that's 9 million. Kissimmee River restoration in Florida, five million. Uh, flood control. Uh, that's uh, Kissimmee is the is the uh, uh, environmental project in, in Florida. Flood control studies uh, related to the recent record flood on the Missouri and Upper Mississippi rivers. Kentucky Dam uh, lock addition in Kentucky. St. John conservation project in Maine. Shoshone project in Wyoming. Topeka, Kansas. Flood control project, Mid Dakota and uh, Mini Wicone projects in South Dakota, Sonoma Bay in California. I, I mentioned uh, the Los Angeles and San Gabriel, Central Utah project, Beaver Lake water transmission in uh, in uh, Arkansas, Arkansas uh, New York Harbor in Channel Islands, and New, uh, New York and Jersey. All together, Mr. President, that I think there are 54 core projects and about another 10 uh, Bureau of Rec projects. Ongoing. Ongoing projects. I mean, are we supposed to stop those? What are, you know, this budgeteering, Mr. President, uh, it, you, 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 you get a new crowd over there at OMB and they say, well, we want to look good. And so they cut back on, on this project knowing that the money's going to be there because it's the they're vital things, but it's sort of playing the old budget game. Mr. Pre President, I can tell you that uh, not only is this prudent budgetary, but that not to fulfill these basic fundamental needs uh, would be a, a, a terrible injustice to people who are uh, subject to further flooding who are seeking relief from uh, the ravages of flood control, who are seeking in some cases uh, uh, opening up of navigation, which is essential to the job base in this, in this country.
and in other instances to pursue environmental values like uh, the senator's bill from last year that uh, involving the Central California, uh, Central Valley of California project. So, Mr. President, I, I, I think this, this amendment makes a nice statement. We've had statements, you know, about what we need to cut here, there, and everywhere. But I can tell you, Mr. President, we're already below last year in real terms, and to cut more would be devastating. And, and I'd I do not believe uh, in prudence that the Senate would seriously consider the amendment, so I will not belabor the point. I, I, I think it is uh, in the is pretty clear. Uh, may I say finally that the bill as recommended is, is, is within the 602B allocation of this committee. So if this were cut, uh, the money would be available for, for other uh, uh, priorities. I don't know what the Senator's priorities are. Uh, and even if he put in language that, in violation of the Budget Act that reduced the, uh, uh, subject to a point of order, would, which would reduce the, the numbers, then you go to conference committee and the House would just say, well, fine, if you don't want to put it in for your priorities, we'll put it in for ours. On uh, that point, just for a question, to clarify for the record, because I do think it's an interesting point that he has made. Um, you're saying essentially that if uh, this amendment passed, there would be $334 million less for these two programs, Bureau and Corps, but the $334 million would simply go back to where? Well, what happens in actual terms is we would cut, cut these back, and we would go to conference with the House, which has a, a similar 602B allocation to ours. I think we're 100 million more in budget authority, but identical in outlays, and the outlays are the constraint in this instance. So we would go to conference with the House, which has their priorities, and we would come with ours, which would have, what's this cut, 300 million less in the House with a different set of priorities, and then we confer. And what would happen is the 602B allocation would be then available to meet the House priorities rather than the Senate priorities. Now, if that sounds like an arcane process, we decided a long time ago to have a two-stage budget process, a financial process in this Congress. First, we battle out uh, the budget resolution and the reconciliation, decide how much we're going to spend. It was a very painful process in both houses, and that played out just a few weeks ago. And the final act of that was, of course, the, the President's budget cutting and revenue package, which passed in each house by one single vote. And some said it's not nearly enough money. So others said it's too much taxes. Said, some said we need this, we need that. But we fought that out. And we came up with a number, which was then distributed to the, to the uh, Appropriations Committee, and that's called the 602A allocation, that is the amount of discretionary spending available to the Appropriations Committee. Then that, in turn, was divided up among the subcommittees, which is called the 602B allocation. We were giving our, given our allocation, which is roughly $21 billion in uh, in budget uh, outlays, and the House has the same outlay number. We, so to the extent we change this and, and cut this, we've already had that fight. Uh, we, we're, we're talking about now whether we take the Senate's uh, 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 priorities or the House's. <laughs> and what the Senator from New Jersey would have us do is, is uh, go, go bargain over their wish list and not over ours. And when I say wish list, I'm not talking about uh, uh, wish list in the sense of fluff list. I'm talking about flooding on the Mississippi River. I'm talking about, and on the Missouri River, I'm talking about navigation. I'm talking about those projects in the Central Valley of California that the Senator did such an outstanding job in passing that legislation. Th that's what we're talking about. Uh, Mr. President, if the Senator uh, uh, 
care to discuss it further, I will. Otherwise, I'm prepared to uh, I, I, Mr. President, I'd just like to just respond very quickly if sure. I could. Um, I think that what you see is this is a bill that uh, touches every state. And therefore, it's uh, very difficult to vote for spending cuts. And there are projects in every state in this bill. And therefore, it is not likely that this amendment is going to be very close. But at the same time, it illustrates a larger point, which is that even if a person stood up on the floor in an appropriations bill and sought to cut spending, in fact, you don't cut spending. It uh, reverts back to an earlier decision. And the public ought to understand the process, because I think frequently uh, people don't understand why we don't cut spending. And the answer is because the process has been so convoluted that it is always easier to manage to tie up in knots someone that wanted to cut spending than it is to actually uh, cut spending. Well, Mr. President, and, if the Senator would and, yield. Yes. Uh, we, we cut the President's budget request by $137 million overall. Was the Senator aware of that? The, we cut the President's overall spending request by $137 million, real cuts. But what we did is we cut some programs, for example, uh, 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 some of the. Uh, some of the defense programs, et cetera, we cut those by a bigger amount and offset these so that the net is a $137 million cut. We just had different priorities and less spending than the president. Now, if you're saying that the president's priorities, and it's really not the president, look, it's those nameless, face, faceless people over in OMB. You think the president went down this list and said, uh, we need to cut... Uh, the uh, Passaic River, New Jersey, or whatever it was, or New York Harbor and Channels. He doesn't know these things are in here. It's not because he's not very smart. He's working on other things. You got, you got somebody over there in OMB who said, uh-huh, uh, O'Hare Reservoir and Cook and Thornton Reservoirs, they're not our priorities. I'd like to put the money, so says this gnome over there, in uh, nuclear weapons testing or whatever. We just had different priorities. The Congress does. And that's what this thing is about. Don't tell me we're not cutting spending. $137 million is real money, and we cut it below the president's request. We just think some of these things, uh, we might have later information. I think we've got later information on floods on the Missouri and Mississippi River. That budget was put together really before those floods got a full head of steam. I would say to the distinguished senator that I appreciate uh, the points that he's made. Um, I think ultimately uh, uh, we should face the fact that uh, we're going to be spending more here uh, than we could in terms of the authorizations last year for the Bureau of Reclamation and the Army Corps. We're going to spend about $334 million more than the president asked for those programs. And that while you read a long list of projects, flood control projects, various projects in this state and that state, many of which I care about, you care about, other members care about. Um, this amendment doesn't cut those projects. This amendment reduces the amount of money to be allocated, and the conference decides which projects are cut whether all are trimmed a little or whether some are eliminated. And I, I can appreciate the, the strength of the argument to assert that every project is going to be cut. But in fact, you can't cut every project because you have $375 billion, $3.75 billion still in the appropriation. So it simply reduces $334 million available for the Bureau construction, operation and maintenance, and inspection, investigation. And it's a very simple amendment. I'm under no illusion that this is going to get many votes. 
But I think the point should be made because I think the point leads to other points. And that is uh, why I've offered the amendment today and uh, why, if the senator prefers, uh, I'm prepared to uh, end the debate. ask unanimous consent that when I make uh, a motion to table that the vote thereon occur Im immediately uh, after the first uh, uh, Bradley Amendment and uh, after the first Bradley Amendment is disposed of and that uh, could be one to ten minutes. That it be uh, ten minutes in duration. Without objection, so ordered. No. Uh, Mr. President, I move uh, to table and uh, ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be a sufficient second. Uh, Mr. President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka. Mr. President. The Republican leader. I'd, I'd ask that the further seeing the quorum call be rescinded. I, I might need a record. Without objection, so ordered, the leader time is reserved. There's time reserved. Yes, it is. That's correct. But I'd ask that my entire statement made as part of the record, and I'll just take a minute or two because I know other members wish to speak. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, on Monday in his speech to the U.N. General Assembly, President Clinton outlined several foreign policy proposals, including greater efforts to strengthen democracies, stem proliferation, to reform the United Nations, and to promote sustainable development. Other recent speeches by Secretary Christopher, National Security Advisor Lake, and U.N. Ambassador Albright laid the foundation for the President's speech. This four-speech offensive seemed designed as a high-level and extended rebuttal to the perception of drift and lack of initiative in the administration's foreign policy. Many of the objectives cited in the administration's speeches are noteworthy. Many deserve our support, including the reforming United Nations and efforts to combat proliferation. What was missing, Mr.